Amnesia the Bunker is one of the best horror games I've ever gotten the chance to play. It's one of the scariest games made in a long time, and that's not just my opinion. Amnesia the Bunker tries to be basically everything that a horror game should be, but it actually is. It not only does a compelling story from the perspective of a World War I French soldier, but it also does the gameplay incredibly well and is innovative like the original Amnesia the Dark Descent. But there's one thing in specific that separates the Bunker and other fictional games projects, and that would be the monsters. You see, Amnesia the Bunker is absolutely incredible, and I don't think you can find an honest opinion of anyone who genuinely doesn't like the game that is an actual fan of horror games and not just someone who calls themselves a horror game fan and they really just watch Garden of Banban. The Bunker takes a step back from what fictional games have mainly focused their development on over the last decade, that being storytelling over an overall horror experience. With this game, they reverted back to what blew up the Dark Descent in the early days. A super horrifying atmosphere with gameplay and a relatively thought out story that is just purely icing on the cake instead of being the whole cake made out of icing like previous games from Frictional. But just because Frictional games have made something that wasn't a quote unquote walking simulator, doesn't make it a top horror game of the year. Just let me introduce you to- The game starts out with a battle scene in World War I most likely in Belgium or some other neighboring country between France and Germany. We play as Henri Clément, a very average French soldier. During whatever battle we are in, we learn some basic mechanics within the world. Stuff like how the guns work, how explosives work, how bricks can break down full walls. You know, the simple stuff. Our good friend Lambert saves us from an ambush of smoke that was thrown into our hideout as we try to make it through the battle scene. We are hit with a major flash grenade and we stumble for who knows how long straight past the battle to where our friend Lambert is heavily injured and unable to walk on his own. We try our best to carry him back to a medic of some kind, but before we get the chance to do so... We black out for what feels like forever as we are basically unconscious for what seems to be possibly days. Suddenly we wake up. We are on some kind of bloodied hospital bed and as we stumble around the room that we are left in we realize two things. One, our wounds have been either healed or patched up and two, we are now trapped in some kind of bunker. And that's our introduction to the game. Pretty incredible intro in my opinion. But if you're not quite convinced that this game is actually any good, allow me to continue. As we start to explore the rooms that we were left in, we come across a note that was apparently from our doctor while we were knocked out down here. Apparently, we had been in some kind of a coma state for a while, and when we originally had awoken, we couldn't remember even our own name. Hmm, I know there's a word for that, I just... I just can't figure it out. Anyways, moving on past the note from our mysteriously missing doctor, we find ourselves a flashlight. But this is not just any ordinary flashlight. Oh no 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 no. This is the world's loudest little piece of crap flashlight you could ever possibly imagine. But it is a fun toy. Apparently it was commonly used around this time period of the first world war. But it's not very fun when you're trying to hide from a monster and you need to see where you're going to find a way to a hideout of some kind. And you power the flashlight and it does this? I'd bet you can imagine how unhelpful this could be. Yet, it's the only source of light that doesn't cost fuel throughout the entire game, so you better get used to its constant winding. Finally, leaving this room we woke up in, we leave to a hallway and walk into some kind of office area. We open the back door and find a pile of something that's dead. Right next to the pile of dead stuff is a conveniently full container of fuel. Don't know why or how it was left there, but I don't feel like speculating because I assume it doesn't have any story implications. Finally deciding to continue discovering whatever this bunker we found ourselves in has in store. Let's just, uh, let's just see here, gonna write something down real quick and yep. Opening a few drawers in the main office room, we find another note from our doctor describing the photo we can take off the wall. The body of Sergeant Raynard. Multiple lacerations, chest cavity torn to shreds, every rib cracked, skull cracked open by repeated blunt force trauma. Who could have done this to him? Apparently it was some kind of soldier and had a lot of damage from presumably some type of creature. No human, even in war, could leave marks and tears at a person like what was left on this man. We now know the real dangers that lie within this bunker. Finally, moving on from the second room that we found, we are guided by a few locked doors to one open cafeteria space to see the creature that inhabits the bunker's main mode of transportation, in the form of through the walls. Which is just delightful information that I could have gone much longer without knowing, thank you very much Mr. Frictional Games. Making our way to the door on the opposite side of the cafeteria, you know, past the open holes where the monster might be able to just grab my tootsies and yank me into Neverland? Yeah, past those. We open the door and hear a voice. It's... It's from another trapped soldier down here in the bunker. 
The soldier recognizes us. Apparently, we were on the same team while fighting in the war. He tells us he's not going to survive much longer, which I can definitely see, and that he would much rather die at the hands of a brother than that thing. Which, who am I to say no to my brother? I've got to honor his dying wish. So we take his unloaded gun and go grab a few bullets left in the supply room behind us. Grabbing the bullets and loading them into our puny pistol, we make our way back to our brother in battle, but before we get within reach of firing. We never even get a name for the man, which is probably a good thing saying that I would have gotten much more attached to him if we had. This is also our first time seeing the monster in action. We don't actually get to see the monster, which becomes a reoccurring theme throughout this game, but seeing our soldier friend lose his life to the one thing he didn't want is heartbreaking. Well, at least we didn't need to waste a bullet on him because let me tell you, resources in this game are far and few between. With our new gun and newfound bullets, we shoot the lock off the next door and with scratching noises from something in the walls around us, we go through and find a big open room. We find a hanging lantern, we turn it on, and our game saves. Now that is what I call an actual intro sequence. This room we find ourselves in is going to be our safe room for at least most of the game. The only way to save progress in this game is to flick the lantern hanging above the table in the middle of the room on and off. There is legitimately no auto save point throughout the rest of the game. You either make progress and get back to the safe room in time to save said progress, or you get found out during your little adventure. Finally, having an actual light source, we look around the room we're in, gather a few leftover materials, maybe put some of those extra materials into the storage box, and we get a chance to see the full map of the bunker. Listen here, because I'm going to teach you all the ins and outs of this place, and you're going to remember every last detail. We've got the administration room, aka the safe room. We've got some storage rooms, the kitchen and the mess hall, which we've already explored through earlier. We've got the office quarters for the soldiers who are working down here. We've got this prison, the soldier quarters, the arsenal, and the maintenance room. Now you better remember everything that I just said, or it's going to be quite difficult to navigate this place the way you want to. Whew. Now then, before we head out of our safe room, there's something in here I didn't mention yet. Something honestly so important I wouldn't be able to play this game without it. That being the generator. The generator does exactly what you'd expect it to. It powers the entire bunker. But this is where fuel comes in, because our generator here is not exactly electrically powered. This is still the early 1900s after all. Our generator here takes some oil. Now, like I said a few minutes ago, materials in this game are very sparse, and fuel is no different. And since this generator of ours eats fuel like nobody's business, it gives the player a pretty difficult decision, with the note being left on the generator that the monster hates lights. So making our way through the bunker will not only be easier for visibility sake, but it will make it quite a bit safer as well. But what if you were to take too long while out of the safe room and the generator runs out of fuel? You're so far into the bunker and making your way back in dark other than our puny little flashlight would be pretty spooky. And with not really wanting to waste any fuel, the choice is pretty difficult to make every time you go exploring. Since the game does give us a stopwatch that counts down the in-game minutes left we have with the power across the bunker. But with being limited to 6 inventory slots and already having 2 taken up by our gun and flashlight, taking the stopwatch is a risk that we don't really know the right answer to. From here, the game kind of becomes open. I mean, as much as a game in a secluded bunker can be. You get to choose which main areas of the bunker you want to explore first in order to find a way to blow up the main exit of the bunker that has been caved in during war going on outside. As you explore all the different sections of the bunker, you discover a bunch of different tools to help you proceed faster through the bunker's corridors, and weapons to help defend yourself from the monster and other possibly dangerous encounters. Some of these items aren't necessary to complete the game and escape, which makes it even more exciting when you find something like the pliers. You know you can complete the game without them, but having them makes exploring that much easier. As well as finding these extra tools, you find other notes detailing the story of what life in the bunker was before and during the attack of the monster. The pictures that come with these sort of lore notes are extremely detailed, and like the one from the beginning of the game, pretty gory. The pictures aren't just to add dramatic effect and to scare the player into thinking about what the monster could possibly do to us, but also just to really paint the picture of what was going on down here while we were in a coma. Just thinking that some random doctor who might have known us, but probably not, tried to care for us during some attack from a monster? He kept us safe and protected for as long as he could, until he presumably was found out. It's tragic, but extremely compelling. Now, six pages into the script of this video, I want to talk about the most impressive part of the game for me, and that would be the way that the bunker in previous fictional games' games do monsters. In the bunker, you can go actual hours without even seeing the monster, and I'm not even exaggerating. The game's design makes sure that you are always aware that the monster is somewhere, but very rarely do you have run-ins with a monster, and when you do, they are usually short-lived because I don't know about you, but I'd rather not go more than 5 seconds with invisible distance of this thing. This lack of knowing with a monster in fictional games goes pretty unnoticed from what I see. 
Frictional obviously knows how to do great villains and monsters in their games. The designs of basically every monster in a Frictional game is incredibly horrifying, no matter the video quality. And with the quality options presented to Frictional in recent times, even if they are using their own game engine, which might be holding them back a bit when it comes to graphic capability. But not only is the monster shown in the bunker genuinely horrific through and through, I mean just looking at this thing move is absolutely disgusting, and just knowing that you and this human shredding creature are the only living things left in this bunker besides the scattered rats that also like to eat humans for some reason, and the functionality of not truly being able to protect yourself from it is honestly just as horrifying as the creature itself. I mean you can defend yourself slightly, you have bullets and grenades that you can use to stun the beast as you make your way back to some form of safety or hideout while the monster goes back into the walls of the bunker but eventually you are more than likely to run out of ammo or grenades before escaping the bunker if your main strategy for defense is attacking instead of hiding. And being left with only hiding as a defense from this creature doesn't always end with you living. And as we find out pretty late into the game, our save room is not exactly the safest room we could have hoped for. You see, entering our save room after a few hours of playtime, once we've started to gain our understanding of what we were trying to finish here and how we plan on getting out, we can find this in our safe room. Wait a minute. There's no comforting music. The monster, somehow, has made our only real safety a part of its caving system, leaving a heavy sense of dread as now this room we find ourselves in is no safer than any other place in the bunker. With all the other functioning systems that go into this game all working together to make a well thought out gaming experience, everything just works so perfectly, which is what makes me love it so much. The possibilities of ways to work your way through the bunker and defending yourself from monsters and being on the watch from old booby traps when the bunker was still up and functioning? Which by the way, why did the soldiers set up traps in their own bunker? They were the only people who were going to be down here in the first place, so why risk injuring your own soldiers? I don't know, it's the French. It's not worth questioning their decisions. The thought of eating repulses me. It repulses me. There's this great video that details the systems that go into the bunker that make it play so perfectly. I highly recommend you check it out after this video. I'll put a link to it in the description. But before that, I want to talk about how the bunker manages to play so perfectly throughout the start and the middle of the game, and also how it sticks an incredible landing with the ending sequence. As you've gathered all the resources necessary to escape the bunker, we discover what the actual purpose of the bunker is. Going into the game for the first time, I suspected the bunker was just a hideout for war and a place for soldiers to recover from injuries in battle. But this theory turned out to be mostly false. The bunker also happens to be the living quarters for excavators of some Roman underground builds. What's left by the time we get to explore it is just a bunch of Roman looking hallways and a few barrels and extra materials. But the best part about this sequence and one of the best things about this game is that in these hallways, we aren't alone. And I don't mean that the rat monster is chasing us through these hallways, that's not what I'm saying. There's another person down here with us in these tunnels. Someone who's managed to avoid the bunker monster for all this time. The man we are trapped with is a one, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it, Toussaint Beaufoy. He's an old soldier who's lost his mind being trapped in the bunker and, oh, well look at that, he's gone and ripped his eyeballs out. Well how fun. Being trapped with this soldier and his absolute brute of a shotgun leaves us mostly defenseless in the misty hallways. Not getting a very good opportunity to even look at the soldier and not having any hiding spots, let alone a reason to use a hiding spot as the man is as blind as it gets. But we must be as quiet as possible, sneaking through the hallways trying to find the exit that will lead us out of this horrible bunker. We have to balance our flashlight windings with time to sneak and times to remain still as getting too close to the soldier renders him aware of our location and gets us blasted. Somehow, after 13 years of game development, Frictional have made a gunfight genuinely scary. We are challenged with trying to fight back against the soldier to win our chance of freedom, and as the gas we're surrounded with poisons our vision, causing hallucinations of ghosts that used to roam these hallways. Or are they hallucinations at all? Who knows, it's not like we can ask the other soldier because he's blind and wants to kill us. Once you do end up getting the chance to blow the soldier in the head with our pistol, retrieve his shotgun and extra detonator from his office, we can finally go back to the bunker one final time to receive our freedom. Except there's one thing you could manage to miss just by heading back after beating the soldier in the gunfight of our lives. If you were to head deeper into the tunnels, you could get our first true taste of freedom. But it only lasts a few moments as we look back up to see that we are still unfathomably trapped down here. This is one of my favorite moments in gaming, as we finally get to see the real world again, only for it to be once again broken by the sounds of gunfire from above. Even if we were able to make it out from this point, it would just lead us back to death.
But there is one other time besides the game's true end that we see a small taste of the outside world. Back in the bunker, we can make it to a small section called the pillbox. A pillbox is like these little hideouts and bunkers like the one that we inhabit that allows for soldiers to peek back out at the war that's going on. If we make it to the pillbox and climb the ladder, we can actually see the outside world for the first time since entering. But our peace is quickly broken just a few seconds after beginning by the sound of a gunshot. We are trapped in a bunker, and the only way out will lead us straight into war. Which, like I said earlier, has a similar chance of death. Before heading back down, if we turn around in the head of the pillbox, we can see a now dead soldier. From what I pick up from this environmental storytelling, it is that this man was indeed alive when the bunker monster first attacked. He made his way from the now infected bunker to the safety of the pillbox, only to share the same fate we narrowly dodged by sheer luck. It's such a sad way to go, but was probably also the best way any soldier occupying the bunker could have gone out. Imagine you survived the bullet shot, or didn't get hit in the first place like us. We've lived that little bit longer, but it's not like we can just go back down. Who knows the true dangers that would lay below? It would have been a horrible fate. One that we now inherit. Going back to the first real time we get to see outside of the bunker, other than the obvious pain that we feel staring freedom in its face without being able to actually touch it, if we stop looking up at the war-ridden sky and look back at the ground we see something that was truly out of this world. In the middle of whatever this crater is that we found our good friend Lambert in back in the beginning of the game is now a pool of some kind of liquid with floating stones of some kind around the pool. This scene is honestly one of the craziest parts about this whole game and another one of Frictional's best showing of their skill with visual storytelling. For as crazy as the monster of the bunker may be, up until this point, the game has been pretty grounded in reality. Like most of the Frictional Games projects, the natural physics of our world have basically always been there. And being a game set in the very real world event of the First World War, using real life tools to try and craft our escape, finding whatever scene this is would absolutely break me if I was in the same shoes as our dear Henri. Without saying a word about the pool of liquid and the floating stones, or even shouting up for help from anybody above knowing that it would most likely be futile, leading to either no response, someone who can't help, or an enemy who would take the opportunity to kill. We head around the other side of the pit and find one of the most comforting items in the entire game. It's right where Lambert laid when we last saw him, which makes little to no sense when you think about it, but just holding this bunny makes me feel safer than even holding our newfound shotgun. With the bunny in hand, we head back into the bunker for what we hope will be the final time. We don't have much of a chance to make it back to the safe room, and at this point it's not even that much of a safe room with the room now being implemented into the monster's caving system. While making it to the soon-to-be exit, if we happen to encounter the monster during this time, we can actually throw the rabbit plush at the monster and something quite interesting happens. It's a rabbit. You like the rabbit? You like the rabbit, don't you? You like that rabbit. You like the rabbit. Yeah. You like the rabbit, don't you? Uh oh. He took it. He took it. He took the rabbit. He just stares at it for a while and holds it close to his chest and retreats back into his caving system in the walls. It's quite shocking, at least to me, that the creature had any sort of reaction to the rabbit, and this is something I never would have expected to be honest. Seeing something we've grown accustomed to having such a visceral, almost human-like reaction to us throwing the plush at it, it leads me down a whole road of theories about if this creature has anything to do with Lambert, the nature of it, and if it has anything to do with the pool of liquid and the floating stones from earlier. Who knows, but it's something interesting to think about. Finally gathering the materials to leave this place, we hit the detonator of our explosives and... We quickly get up and rush over to what we still believe to be our exit. It's what the sign said after all, but as the smoke distills we see... More rubble. And a hole leading straight down? I guess there's more to this place than we originally believed. Going down this hole we are led to an even deeper caving system than we've seen yet. Finding old, forgotten barrels and hearing the crawling of the monster that we've grown so accustomed to at this point, we make our way through to... No words I could come up with truly explain the awe that comes with seeing these... platforms in the middle of a big empty cave? Dome? Whatever it is. Walking through, we spot, once again, the Rat King himself. Apparently giving him that toy didn't settle his anger with us. Completing one of the scariest boss battles I've ever played through, we finally, legitimately make it to Frida. Oh no.
Amnesia the Bunker, one of horror's greatest. And I hope you all now see why I appreciate it so much. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye bye